Welcome to the Board Game Secret Show. This is episode four. I can't believe it. I've made it four episodes, four weeks in a row. Ugh, consistency. Eee, almost feels adultish. I don't know. I do work for the for the record. This is the show that nobody knows about. We're going to keep it between you and I. Let's start the conversation in the comments. In fact, that's my one call to action for you is engage. Engage with what we're talking about. This last week was a, uh, honestly, it's a pretty big breakthrough. Uh, the the episode did incredibly well. There was uh, tons of you out there that uh, engaged and commented and we had discussions and debates and that was really fun. It actually um, brightened up my week quite a bit. So a note about the show format as we are now on week four and it's starting to evolve a little bit and I have um, lots of ideas on how to have it evolve uh, in the future. I want to set a precedence for engagement and communication. That's what I really want this show to be about. If you're listening at any time, if a thought comes into your head, I am encouraging you to stop the show and just throw your comments and thoughts out there. Start it up again and rinse and repeat. I uh, had a blast this last week, um, you know, engaging with everyone's comments, and it was just really cool. It actually brightened up my week quite a bit. I mean, really, it's just a just a personal thing. All right. So schedule this week is I have a FOMO pick of the week. What I am playing, I have three games that I'm going to talk about and stuff I'm consuming. And then the big topic, uh, it revolves around a poll about whether you would rather play the new hotness or play an old favorite. And the main topic is, oh gosh, it's something along the lines of uh, games that are <laughs> extremely obsessible. <laughs> I don't think that's the word. Grokkable? Um, I, I don't think that's a word either. Speaking of the poll and wanting to play kind of old favorites, what games do you love to dive deep into, wish you had more time with, maybe you do have plenty of time with, and you absolutely go deep in those We'll get to all of that. But first, it's our FOMO pick of the week here. For the FOMO pick of the week, there's a little bit of a difference here. It's tiny, it's cheap, and it's due to deliver in June, which is, um, I guess I better look. To, is that next year? I didn't, I didn't, I just like uh, kind of like, you know, perused over that real quick before I send you off in the wrong direction. June 2024. Yeah. So this is a solo experience. This is a game that was out that's been out for a while. However, the uh, Gabe Barrett is developing an adventure mode to it. I watched a one stop co-op shop video on it. It looked really interesting. And I just think it's a breath of fresh air in a space that's $300 board games that we're going to get in three years from now. So, yeah, I just wanted to kind of point out the anti-FOMO option for you all. Um, I I recently got uh, burnt by FOMO, if you watched my most recent video. Uh, so, you know, this is a low. Even if it doesn't deliver in June, there is a low risk. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just a fun kind of adventure game. There's items and quests and it plays really quickly. I mean, what is the playtime on this thing? It says seven minutes, ages seven plus it basically a deck of card and some dice. I don't have much else to say other than it looks fun. It's cheap. It's delivering soon. It's not $300. We're not going to get it three years from now. And even if you do hate it. Uh, it's not that big of a deal, <laughs> but it looks good. The art, the art is cool. The art's whimsical. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's dice rolling, dice mitigation, items, uh, quests, all, all that kind of fun stuff. So that's, it's, it's a brief FOMO pick of the week. My FOMO level isn't, isn't, uh, at a 10 per se, but it is a breath of fresh air seeing something like this on crowdfunding. <laughs> It's time to play. All right. What I am playing. Speaking of small box card games, Unreliable Wizard. This was a this was actually a, a FOMO uh, buy, but it was very similar in that I don't remember when I backed this thing. This thing was like not that long ago. Yeah, this project was funded in September of 23, like $90,000, really small. Salt and Pepper Games brought this game basically to the United States via crowdfunding. One player, it's like uh, 20 minutes or so 
is the gameplay and the premise is uh, i mean it's pixelated art it's kind of video gamey you have a um kind of a world map that you are moving along and as you get to a particular square that's connected to a monster you have to battle it and it has a really unique kind of um, mechanism in which you line up the monster and then there's a card that augments that monster depending on the type of terrain you encountered it with so it, it creates a ton of different uh, a, a ton of variability and it basically gives it certain different levels of defense based upon spell type and uh, you are a unreliable wizard because you're drawing cards into your hand and you don't necessarily know um, what type of spell you're getting. And you can get cards that uh, synergize together to, to make a more powerful spell, which essentially does more damage based upon that spell type. And it's pretty fun. You go and you, you knock these monsters off one by one. You are upgrading. You get, um, oh, what are they? Uh like companions that augment yourself and, and it all still goes in the same stack of cards. And basically the entire kind of battle is stacked up. I don't know. I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's better than my description of it because it's, it's pretty unique. And I felt like it's just fun. It's, it's, uh, it's not incredibly punishing or hard, but um, I, I still lost to it. But basically, you, you go through this labyrinth of things and you're losing life every single movement you make. So you're balancing like which which um, what is it? A hex that I'm I need to go to next. It's going to take off more life than going the other direction. Um, there's some hexes that will give you more life as well. You could avoid monsters and just try to get to the boss but you're not going to be powerful enough once you get there in fact that's my first playthrough i think i skipped a couple monsters and um, none of my spells did enough damage to get past the defense so um you really want to try to clear the map but you're balancing that against your life points because uh, movement costs life and so on and so forth but it's only 20 minutes it's a quick play it's um you know, uh, our, the art style is interesting, but it's pixelated. Uh, I think, you know, the, the words JRPG have been uh, thrown in in the description. I don't necessarily know how exactly that that relates, but um, and I and I don't know if this is even um, available for you. But either way, I played a couple plays just kind of off to the side as I was trying to clear my brain from playing uh, Seventh Citadel, which that's a whole nother story i in fact i'm that, that that's technically what i played this week um it dominated uh <laughs> at least the beginning parts of the week uh if you want to know that whole story though go check out go check out that video it's actually done really well um it, the link will be in the description uh next up world wonders uh this is for me an old favorite i guess it's not really an old favorite it's a um it's actually the most recent oh, coffee break it's actually the most recent addition to our Polyomino library, and I probably need to do a video on it. Um, we are quite the Polyomino connoisseurs in this household, um, and you know my wife likes the puzzly aspect, and I like whenever um, a designer can add in you know some form of, of strategy or or extra mechanic on there to to make it thinky for me, and this one does it. Um, this is a a world building game you are um set with a budget each and every round and it's up to you how you want to spend it there's a, a kind of a, a tableau of polyomino pieces that you're essentially drafting and paying for going back and forth the interesting thing is there's these monuments all of these monuments have different requirements so you would have had to build different building pieces and have them arranged in a particular way that they're adjacent to the monument for you to be able to take it. The 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 kind of rub with this game is typically something like a monument or a big building would 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 cost a lot. It would be something that you're building up for. And what you're building up for is just getting the the right pieces in the right spot to be adjacent to it because the very last move you have on a round is you can spend whatever you have left as long as you have one coin left and um and grab the monument as long as you have the the placement requirements. Um, the other interesting thing is each and every one of these, um, building pieces have symbols on them and you have these tracks on your board with, I believe it's three, it's blue, green, and red, um, 
I don't know, like symbol components. And you're trying to go up on these tracks. And every time you get to uh, what amounts to a, a white um, head symbol, you go up on the white head track. And if you go up far enough on that track, you get these bonus points. You also score points based upon a balanced approach because you score points up to the highest level of your lowest building component, uh, if that makes sense. So there's definitely a little bit of a puzzle there. You're also trying to you know, score points for being adjacent to these little land or rock pieces. You're also trying to fully encompass um, your buildings with other buildings and cover all sides. You get points for that. Um, there's an advanced mode that we actually haven't played yet, and I want to want to do that. That I think introduces goals, but overall it's really cool. In fact, I was inspired to play it again, Edward at Heavy Cardboard. I, I seem to mention him every every, uh, every playthrough, but I uh, or every episode because I watch his playthroughs all of the time. And he happened to be playing this solo, which I've never played solo, and um, he, he really enjoyed it. So he inspired me to play it with my wife. And I did notice that I think at multiplayer you have a whole new dimension because the automa is kind of randomly selecting monuments and by happenstance it looked like it had to draw the right card to have the right monument available because only a couple of them i think three are available at a given time in a two in a multiplayer game you are keenly aware of what other players board state looks like because you are trying to predict can i take one more piece and 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 bring my coins down to one or you know really maximize this turn by getting as many pieces as possible before i select a monument however if another person has that same setup or has the right pieces in the right spot to be able to grab that monument all of a sudden there's tension and tension in a game is to me is so important and in this particular game as you are you know, vying for these same monuments, the it, it, it gets the heart beating a little bit as you start to see them grab the blue piece. Now you know they're setting it up because that monument needs that blue piece and they put it next to, uh, you know, water and that monument also needs water. And then all of a sudden, you know what they're trying to do. So, and, you know, even though you have four coins left and you could easily grab another piece, you're going to go ahead and grab that monument instead. Uh, my my son is wild when he plays this game. He'll grab monuments early and often and basically wipe his board of coins. And, um, you know, he has a much less built out board, but he actually enjoys doing that because it just, you know, messes with us. Anyways, that's World Wonders. Uh, I, I love that game. I'm going to keep you playing it. I probably need to do some coverage on it. I could definitely see I could definitely see an expansion on that one in the future. But uh, we'll see. All right. And the third game, Septima. I'm two games into Septima. Septima. Oh, coffee break. Septima, I've watched rules and play through, honestly, like 10 times. It delivered late. And when I say late, it wasn't horrific, but it's a witch themed game. And everybody wanted it before uh, Halloween. And, and it didn't didn't get here before Halloween. Just from like a content perspective, I put it to the side. I had other stuff I wanted wanted to cover, and it was it was less relevant as kind of a holiday game. But it, it really isn't. It's really not a holiday game. It's just witch theme. It's 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 set in the time of the uh, witch trials, and you are essentially what amounts to a good witch, just trying to heal people. You're just trying to go around a board and heal these afflicted patients with your potions and and. Uh, and but then also mitigate the risk of being hunted by these hunters that are sitting around the edge of the board. And that matters because you're trying to grab the right ingredients for the potions. And those ingredients are by these hunters. And, you know, there's this action selection system around um, card play and matching. And you can match with uh, what amounts to the game. There's 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 a Septima or a Head Witch that has different symbols each round. And if you match with them, you get to do bonus stuff. And if you match with another player, you get to do bonus stuff on your card. But that matching makes the suspicion go up. And then it throws this hunter out on the board. And um, you're kind of rolling for your fate and seeing if you get caught. If you get caught, you, uh, you, you lose a witch that's on your board. These witches give you... Um, really awesome kind of uh, powers and benefits and um, you know at that same time you're trying to get what are sympathetic people into a crowd which is kind of this mini game that's off to the side in which you're 
you're balancing your actions on the board and healing patients with because uh, at the end of each phase, I think there's four moon phases, um, you go to trial and the witch that is either that you lost or this witch that's kind of randomly drawn and goes to tile. And the mechanism is, amounts to you can acquire that witch and get a new power if you win the trial. And it's you and other players' pieces versus angry members of a crowd that, you know, get in there um, – uh, get in there a, a few different ways. We won't go deep into that. I'll save the review. Anyways, you pull these uh, crowd members out of a bag and you put them in the chamber and the you combined with another player. If you beat the angry citizens, the trial is won. The person with the most uh, sympathetic or your, you know, your color um, citizens in the crowd, you win the trial, you get points, you get um, you get the witch, you can bring it bring it into your coven, and now you have a new power. And that's kind of the basic game, and that's how they, they start you out, um, which amounted that first playthrough was uh, kind of basic. I asked my wife, you know, what did you think of it? And she's like, I didn't know, like, there wasn't a lot to do. And I said, well, good, There's that's not even the full game. So uh, I just got the secondary full game play done, and wow, it changed it a lot. I'm definitely working on a review here, so I won't go too deep into it, but there's a sideboard that's added that, I don't know, it, it, it benefits you to really program your actions because it allows you to move down a, tr a track that has you know two choices on each movement and if you use the right action at the right time you get to move down that track and why is that important it's important because there's these spell cards that um really kind of break the game and give you like insanely awesome powers that um you know spoiler alert for the uh review that's probably coming this week at some point um, it was my aha moment once we added that track in. So uh, it's also beautiful. It's Mind Clash games. It's a what you'd what I think Mind Clash would say is midweight for their offering. Um, but as you start to add the the full game, and you also add, um, you know, there's an expansion as well that does some other stuff that I've yet to get into, so I won't really comment on. It's it's fairly complex. It's no void fall, but it's um it's it's definitely thinky. I don't think you'll be seeing this thing in Target anytime soon. But you know, who who knows? It's beautiful. The production on this thing is absolutely beautiful. I could go on forever on Septima. Um I was really excited to get this thing and I'm happy I finally got it to the table. I'm gonna get a play in today. Um I probably need, I don't know, three or four more plays before I can start working on the review, but uh hopefully I get I, I get a couple in today. All right, that is Septima from Mind Clash Games. That is everything that I, at least I wanted to talk about that I'm playing. And there is more I'm going through now, but I'm saving it for next episode here. Um, we are already, what, 20 minutes in. What I'm consuming this week, I have a little bit of a mix here. I've got a, oh, what is it, a, a BGG forum. I've got a podcast, and I also have a video here. So first and foremost, the forum, uh, or I guess it's an article, it's a post. It's a it's a post on BGG, and it's uh, entitled Measuring the Shut Up and Sit Down Effect. You might not care about this, so I'll be fairly brief on it, but the uh, impetus of this article is utilizing data in, in which to um, to measure the effect of when shut up and sit down makes a video and it's significant. The effect is significant. And I think the impetus for this was John company and its video. And it definitely jumped when you take a look at the graph, the moment that these videos happen, um, it, it is also measuring it via ratings per se. I would be really interested to see what sales did. Um, obviously you're kind of making a correlation with ratings and sales, um, but it's an it's an immediate jump that that happens and and then wanes. He also goes through noticeable increases here. Um, Phantom Inc had quite the bump. Bamboo had a big bump. Hamlet had a big bump, and then a, a, another huge rise right after that. Some some games in particular, Hidden Gems, really thrive under the spotlight of Shut Up and Sit Down. Um, 535 is one such example. Over 70% of new ratings after the review can be attributed to that review. 
Uh, the article also goes into um, creating a synthetic control, which is essentially a projection or forecast into the future, uh, which is a, a, a clever way to do it in which they're projecting what that game would have continued to do hadn't the shut up and sit down video review um, have had happened. So I, I thought it's, I think it's interesting, obviously, because I, I make content and, um, you know, you might or might not, but uh, I'll have that linked in the show notes that is measuring the shut up and sit down effect by Marcus Shepard. Marcus, great job. I thought that was a, uh, a fun article to read. What else am I consuming? A board game bollocks. Um, so Rajas of Rajas the Ganges um, was just covered by board game bollocks. I love when larger creators um, cover old games. I think it's it's a really great signal for people coming into the game world that there's still really awesome stuff out there that you don't have to wait for. You could probably get insanely cheap. You could probably easily make a trade for. It's not the hotness. Um, I really enjoyed this video from Board Game Bullocks. I love his channel. If you don't like the words fuck or shit, then don't watch it. <laughs> it's not safe for work. Um, he's raw and uh, his takes are, are, are really good. I just really enjoy what he has to say about games in general. And he delivers it in a unique and an entertaining way in a landscape of a lot of sameness out there in a landscape of we get 10 videos all on the same game the moment um, the uh, NDA drops, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's refreshing. He's refreshing. He's a great channel. So check him out. Uh, something I've been listening to on my runs. So very wrong about games. Michael Walker, Mark Bigney. Um, they have an insanely vast board game knowledge and their podcast is one of my favorites. I've got a bunch of board game podcasts that uh, frankly have actually, um, inspired this show and um they're certainly one of them every time i listen to them i get kind of imposter syndrome because they have such a vast knowledge and and deep history in this uh hobby they've got tons to draw from when they're comparing different games and it amounts to kind of a recommendation engine for me as i kind of run around the block huffing and puffing uh, it, uh it's, it's it's a great podcast and i absolutely recommend you check that one out um not much else to say. It's just uh, just good stuff, you know, if you just have nothing else to do and you don't want to stare at a screen, but you do want to listen to some people talking about board games. Check out So Very Wrong About Games. Now we're going to get into the main topic here. All right, so I put up a poll. Would you rather play the hotness or play an old favorite? And in fact, right now, pause the video. Let me know in the comments. What would you rather play? The newness, the hotness, the thing that everyone's talking about, or that old dusty game that's sitting in your collection that you just absolutely love to play. So I had uh, 66 votes here. 35% um, want to play the hotness and 65% say they want to play an old favorite. We did get a couple comments, in, including uh, Edward at uh, Heavy Cardboard. He said yes, uh, meaning he'll play both. So uh, I, I think some people fall in there as well, and it might depend on what mood you're in. However, I was honestly really surprised. 65% uh, of you that answered this poll want to play the old favorite. You know, I think there's this like, uh, I don't know, there's a constant conversation around FOMO and Kickstarter and GameFound and and marketing and and hotness and hype and that's the first thing that's on the bgg forum or on the bgg uh website is that hotness staring at you um that's where i get a lot of inspiration to kind of grab games um but there's definitely something to say for playing that old game right like uh, I, in fact, I sat down after this poll and I started to think a little bit about pros and cons on new versus old. So new pros, it's exciting. You get to learn new things. You know, you can explore something brand new and unwrap it. It, it fulfills the consumerism addictions that we have. Uh, it gives you the dopamine hit. And for me, playing a new game is really figuring out a new puzzle. And that's what has, I don't know, sustained me in this hobby it's not necessarily playing something that just came out it's just a new game for me and a new puzzle for me to kind of figure out and um 
and 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 dive into and that's what's that's what excites me about a game i can't play the same game over and over and over again there's a couple exceptions there which we'll talk about but in general um i think the the luster of a game for me at least can uh wear away fairly quickly especially when i really figure out how the puzzle pieces are put together um and and that ten, tends to happen pretty quickly for me um, some cons, though, are the time investment to learn the game. I mean, learning new games, especially when you get into the complexity. I just spoke about Septima, and that's not, not an incredibly difficult game, but it, it's, it takes time. It takes a few hours. It takes a watch. Watching a playthrough sometimes, which is an hour, like it's, it's, it takes up a lot of time. And, and while I said learning as a pro, it's fun for me to kind of dive in and learn something new. It's also a burden. It's 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 tough. Then you have to teach it. And teaching is tough depending on your game group. And if you're the one in which that has to has to do that teach, sometimes it can be exhausting uh having to do that. Um money. This this is the number one con here. I mean, you know, if you're watching this channel, you likely have a bunch of games sitting behind you as well uh, that are collecting dust. And it's honestly crazy to go buy another one when you have really good stuff sitting behind you that, you know, even my criteria of like learning something new and getting bored hasn't been met on many of the games that that sit behind me. So you know, there's that. And then speaking of sitting behind me, it's space. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm in a shed here and I have kind of like mainstay games, but the, the house is just like, it's just like every nook and cranny. I'm constantly, um, you know, <laughs> have games downstairs laying in different areas. And, and my wife is constantly pushing them away and putting them in places that are very obvious for me to grab and, <laughs> and put away myself. We're constantly playing this battle of like that game can't live there. Um, you know, so and these games are getting really freaking big, uh, especially if you get anything on Kickstarter now, like the FOMO pick I, I uh, uh, had talked about earlier is not the case, but most of them are are insanely huge. Uh, you know, Voidfall, this is a giant this galactic play. This is a giant box here. Um, well, <laughs> this is an entire we'll, we'll get to this chest. We'll get we'll get there. Uh, I'm just looking at all these games that I have. I'm. I, <laughs> Oh gosh, this is another this is another uh, subject, but I have the Everdell Complete Collection, and oh, the moment that I saw that box arrive, I was just like, I made a mistake. Like it's freaking Everdell. Why on earth would I have committed that much space? It actually was a good deal. I think it was like two hundred bucks for all of the expansions, Deluxify. Like it's 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 a uh, uh, it was a pretty good relative deal, which is why I couldn't pass it up. But when that thing arrived, that space is insane. Do you have space concerns as well? That's like, you know, if you're and if you are a collector of board games, I mean, I don't know how many people don't have space concerns. Like it's 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 tough. All right. So moving on to the old pros, familiarity, comfort, speed you can get it to the table fast you've played this game a ton of times um you get space back if you just play your old familiars and if they're old they're less likely to be big i think there is a correlation between newer and bigger i think these boxes are getting bigger so you know there might be a natural space trade-off there minimal teaching your game group likely know likely knows what this thing is Better understanding of the depth of the game, which we'll get to as well. Let's put a pin in that. Um, and better understanding of the meta games within the game. And my old cons, I couldn't think of many. They become stale. You can find flaws, exploits, and kind of happy paths to victory. You know, the veil of newness might wear off and, and kind of design flaws might become apparent that aren't there in the beginning because you just don't understand it enough. You know, but that's it. Uh, when I kind of run the pros and cons on it, it sounds like older is better. And according to you in that poll, you would rather play that old familiar game. So, you know, my hat's off to you. I don't know if you're telling the truth or not. Um, the, the board game publishers certainly don't want to hear that. That's for sure. They want to sell you the hotness and the newness. But the real meat and potatoes of this subject are I want to know from you what games you like to dive deep into. Think about it right now. Pause it. What is the game or games that 
you do, number one, dive super deep into, that you can just throw on the table. You never have to look up a rule. You know everything about it. It's the ins and it's outs, the 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 different kind of metagames within that game, the, the happy paths to victory, the things that are broken, the broken combinations. Um, what is that game for you? Or what is the game you want to be able to do that with? Meaning like you see a ton of potential in that game. You really get excited about the puzzle it's presenting or the world that it's putting you into. And you want to know more. You want to um, become an absolute expert in this thing. And you'd love to have a group that just wants to play this over and over. It obviously can be a solo game as well. But what are those games for you? I'm, I'm selfishly interested because I really like this I don't know. It's almost like a genre. I really like the idea of going super deep into the cogs of these games and seeing but underneath the hood what makes this thing tick and intimately knowing what exactly it is you need to manipulate to get the best outcome. And I think there's some games out there that that really um, shine with the more plays. There's Definitely games that lose luster very quickly, but there's games that your first couple playthroughs, you are not going to understand the brilliance of these games. So what are those games for you that over time you just fall in more and more in love with the more you play them? I've got some games for you in those categories, but I want to hear from you first. Pause it. Give me those. I have four games for you that I love to dive deep into. I may not be to the point in which I'm an expert in them, but uh, I love them enough that I, I, I and I think there's enough kind of meta aspects to it and things to explore that they're not going to get old for me. And they haven't yet. First and foremost is is definitely the newest to this list. It's Voidfall. Voidfall is a little bit different than basically everything else I'm going to talk about in that there's, there is some asymmetry. Um, you know, the different houses have different kind of capabilities and some of them have different cards to use, but the complexity of this game and the scenario based nature where there's all of these different scenarios that you can play against the co-op and solo is spectacular. The competitive version is spectacular. There's a um, there is a ton to explore in this game. There's so many of these cogs that are fitting together that it's hard. Like it, this was one of the hardest videos I ever had to make was trying to explain somebody Voidfall because woo, the rules lift on this thing is pretty tough, or at least it was for me. Um, Paul Grogan over at Gaming Rules really helped that. I really recommend those videos. And uh, my video as well, if you want a nice kind of overview and my thoughts on what amounts to be a brilliant game, but you really don't need to watch that to understand my take on this. I love it. It is a 4X um, Euro, and that's it's pretty unique in that um, there is battling, but all of the battling is essentially deterministic. It's a math problem. There's no dice rolls. It's kind of you know, I wouldn't call it perfect information, but you have a uh, you certainly know if you're going to win a battle when you go into it. Um, but it's it's a lot about resource management and production and engine building. The action selection on your cards is is really fun and interesting. Um, I don't have enough time to go into the depth of it. And that's the point in Voidfall is there's so much there for me to explore. And if I wasn't running this channel, I probably would have played this game, I don't know, 50 times by now. I just haven't had the time, frankly, to do it. But there is, there's a ton to explore in this giant ass box. <laughs> um, the, so the next game here, I think will probably be on many of your lists and it's Spirit Island. I mean, Spirit Island is a oldie but goodie at this point. Um, Oof, like, where do I even start with Spirit Island? I mean, this, so this is a kind of anti-colonialism um, cascading failure of a game. You are on, on an island and you are controlling a spirit or spirits. These spirits are highly symmetrical. Uh, and, uh, these spirits are highly asymmetrical. They all do totally different things. The mechanics are related to the theme of each and every spirit. And there's mechanics in which that makes a cascading 
uh, effect of them taking over the island and you're trying to beat them in a couple different ways, either by fully kind of expelling them off the island or creating so much fear in them that they run away. And uh, it's so deep because there's so many spirits. And this is this is a game that there is tons of resources. And I think that also might be a, a common link between all of the games from here out that I'm going to talk about. There's tons of people that want to talk on the internet about the depth of the game and strategies and this one is no uh different if you want to get an idea of kind of how deep this thing goes i found a channel called red revenge i believe it is and he goes really deep in in synergies on different spirits and and strategies super high level strategies and playthroughs on each of these spirits he does um i think he does consistent tier lists as well um the, he in fact he has a really great video that I'll link about all of the resources related to um Spirit Island which is exactly what has me bringing this game up to you is there is a ton of content out there from people that absolutely love this game this is one of those games that this could just be your game you could only play this because of the interaction between you playing the spirit you're building a deck with kind of common cards that are typically always available as they come into a market you can really get into the meta of what are good and bad cards there's definitely strong opinions on on what's good and what's bad and what cards you want to get for what spirit there's symbols that synergize for with powers on each of their each of their play mats i, I could go on and on about this thing and it's just got expansion after expansion nature incarnate just came out with a bunch of uh which are, amount to pretty high level complex spirits but they are um look super fun especially if you've gotten to the point where you've played everything up until this moment it just adds more of all of the really great stuff about spirit island and it is a bingeable game um, there's an app as well that i absolutely love the app I think I got away from the app because it was subscription based. I can't remember what it was, but I'm probably going to buy it on Steam. I may even may even play it on on a stream, um, which I have not streamed yet. But that's something I'm I'm kind of preparing to do now. Uh, but yeah, it's just it's it's there's so much there, and um, it's it's co op, probably one of the best solo games of all time. And uh, if you haven't played it before, I highly suggest the app. I mean, go go check that out. It's it, it makes it super easy to play. Setup is a little bit rough. That's why the app is 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 so important. I think, especially if you want to get a lot of reps in on a game, um, it's so much easier easier to do so. But yeah, that's Spirit Island. Definitely a game that. I want to dive deeper into, but I absolutely love it's it's absolutely up there and in, in one of my top certainly top three solo games of all time. All right. Next is a competitive game that is all the rage right now. I think anything with this name is sitting somewhere in the top 25 of VGG and it's it's related to the movie Dune, Dune Imperium. I mean, this thing has um, really blown up. Dune Imperium is kind of a lifestyle game now, and it's not one in which I saw early on. I mean, when I first was exposed to Dune Imperium, it was at the same time as Arnak and the same time as Endless Winter, two other uh, worker placement deck building games that I absolutely love. And I thought I loved more than Dune. Um, but there has been such a meta that has kind of come up. Uh, for Dune and so many people talking about the um, different strategies with the different houses, it's just kind of um, completely blown up. But I guess I'll back up real quick. If you don't know what Dune Imperium is, it's a worker placement deck building game. You start the game as one of the um, characters in Dune. There's like an innate ability. There's also a special ability that's related to a card that's naturally in your deck. So when you come up, it meets a condition you can use it but um with those two pieces of of information creates this asymmetry and i would call it light asymmetry but just enough to be able to uh, to make a pretty decent differentiation on your play style it certainly will send you in an, in an immediate uh, direction but you're basically you know battling other people here for resources of dune trying to collect spice and money and water to be able to go to the right places on the board um, you're really just trying to score a few points. <laughs> That's it. I think it's 10 points is all you're trying to score, which is a breath of fresh air in games that are scoring hundreds of points. It makes points feel really, really, um, 
you know, uh, valuable, uh, lots of grinding to go and get a couple points. Um, but there's, you know, there's ways to take points away from other people. There's a really kind of cool um, combat mechanic that is almost a little mini game within the game. Um, and then there's, you know, the card market and the cards that are in that market. There's that's where the depth comes in. You're trying to buy cards that synergize with other cards in your deck. There's um, cards related to the specific houses in Dune, and typically they synergize with each other. So it it helps it a little bit. But there's there's a huge community here. Some of my favorite um, creators that have taught me a little bit. Orski is great. Go check his channel out. A lot of really great Dune content there. Lord of the Board also has done some some pretty uh, darn good um, strategy videos as well. And the Dune Imperium app, this is what his, his um, uh, Dune Imperium Digital just launched. And this is what's really kind of uh, reinvigorated me because, you know, my wife will play it. And, and this is one my game group uh, really likes and, and I can get it to the table. But to really get deep into a game, you need something that you can kind of play over and over and over really, really easily. And Dune Digital, Dune Imperium Digital is great. If you want to hear any sort of uh, review on that, let me know. I've been thinking about that. I certainly want to make this one of the games uh, I stream, um, but it's uh, it's just so good. Uh, it's also Mr. Beast's favorite game, by the way. Mr. Beast uh, won a Dune Imperium tournament. I think that also helped with the popularity of this game. Um, there's multiple expansions for Dune Imperium. There's also Dune Uprising, which uh, is, is a revamped version of the game right after we got to um, expansions. Uh, that's a subject in and of itself. But it doesn't take away from the fact that this game is highly bingeable and uh, one in which you can just fall into and really just make this your game. All right, and probably the game that I have obsessed over the most, and it's really what started this channel, it's Too Many Bones. And it's interesting because Too Many Bones is, is really different from a lot of what I play in general. It's a dice-building RPG, and you're creating a... Um, uh, uh, a gear lock. Um, and when I say creating, you're upgrading its kind of powers and abilities, and they come in the form of dice. And these dice are rolled for specific effects. And you have kind of a grid based map that you are battling um, baddies and then eventually tyrants. And, you know, each kind of playthrough is a one shot. There's a campaign expansion, but in general, they're one shot, cuts a couple hours. You sit down, you go through this journey. You, you go through um, a bunch of uh, different little scenarios that, that are really, really unique. I think there's a ton of replayability just because Chip Theory has introduced so many different scenarios, but there's also so many different um, gear locks. In fact, this entire wooden chest, that won't even open. I think I have all my gear lock mats are, are stuck. But this entire thing is filled with neoprene dice and chips this is this is one gear lock here um they they each come with a two-sided strategy guide essentially on pvc and did i mention you probably know too many bones if you're uh if, if you're watching this but it's it's the production on it is absolutely insane but anyways the depth in this game comes a couple different ways it comes through the gear locks and there's a ton of them i don't even remember how many there are at this at this point um but if you have them all it's almost infinite replayability um the the skills that you are kind of upgrading or training along the way you're not going to get to all of them each and every game so there's different strategies that you can employ also, depending on what other gear locks you're playing with, you can you can play this co-op or multi-handed solo. So you similar to Spirit Island, you can get things that synergize with each other and kind of build each character differently. Um, it's insanely punishing. Sometimes it's totally unfair, but it is one playthrough. It's not this big campaign game. If you um, if you biff it early on, oh, set, reset it and just start over again. It's not that big of a deal. But you basically have a certain number of days to get through a certain number of encounters to make it to the big bad tyrant. This tyrant is this kind of baddie that has superpowers. And the scenario in which that you're kind of thrown into with them is totally different from everything else that you would just... There's also... Um, and they're incredibly difficult. There's each expansion has has created new map mechanics. 
um, in Undertow, there you're on a raft, and there's like you know water creatures that surround that raft, and you can break pieces on the raft that you can't go on. And and then in uh, Unbreakable, there's now a volcano and lava spaces. I mean, there's just so much to interact with this game. I mean, there better be if I have an entire Calyx box, Calyx shelf size box full of this thing. But it's just, it's, it's a game that I can curl up with myself and just play for hours and hours and hours and never really feel bored of. That's too many bones by Chip Theory Games. I can go on with that one forever. I've got a bunch of Too Many Bones content, especially early on in this channel, um, including uh, all the new gear locks I have guides for. I do plan on getting back to to Too Many Bones and, and kind of creating the full catalog of gear lock guides and more playthroughs and, and all of that stuff. It's just the Too Many Bones content was a, a ton of work and, um, you know, only so many people wanted to see a two-hour playthrough of Too Many Bones. I know you're out there, though. I, I, I still see the comments. Those are my games that I am either currently or want to do more of diving deep into. I think there's a ton of games that fall into this. What is the games in which that you just can't stop playing or you want to get deep into? I'm 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 definitely open for kind of exploring those games and and exploring deep dives a little more on this channel. Uh, I'm totally open to that. So, you know, what do you love? I, I want to hear about it. All right, that's it. That's the end of the agenda for this week. I would also like to hear about what you want to talk about. I'm always up for ideas. I have a short list of kind of subjects for future episodes, but I want to hear more. I, I need the inspiration there. So uh, let me know. And if you made it this far, I really, really appreciate it. This has been kind of a fun show to start. And um, you all have reacted pretty well to it. So uh, I guess I'm going to keep doing it. That said, I'm out of here. Have a great week. I'll see you next week.